It would be a great privilege to be left any assets after a person close to you has died. Or heck, if anybody left you any money even if you hardly knew them. This isn't an event that one does not normally happen once, let alone twice in one person's lifetime. But can you imagine that scenario happening 132 times over? Dr. John Bodkin found himself in this very predicament. Although never found guilty of murder or professional negligence, the fact that he was the beneficiary of 132 patients' wills seems a bit odd, if you ask me. Middle-aged and not known to be an outstanding doctor, he was recognized as being a compassionate and considerate doctor, particularly to his elderly patients who in turn trusted him greatly. The main concern regarding his professionalism is because he had a nasty habit of giving his elderly patients dangerous drugs, and his deep interest in his patients' wills raised suspicion. Edith Alice Morell was a patient of Dr. Adams who had been particularly paralyzed after suffering a stroke. Adams supplied her with a cocktail of heroin and morphine to ease her discomfort, insomnia, and symptoms of cerebral irritation that was a condition of her illness. However, three months before Morell's death on November 13th, 1949, she added a clause to her will stating that Adams was to receive nothing. Despite this clause, Dr. Adams, who maintained that Morell had died from natural causes, still received a small amount of money, Cutterly, and a Rolls Royce. The second alleged victim of Dr. Adams did not occur until seven years after Miss Morell had died. Gertrude Hullett was another patient of Dr. Adams who fell ill and then into unconsciousness. Despite not even being dead, Dr. Adams called a local pathologist, Francis Camps, to make an appointment for an autopsy. When Camps realized that Hullett was still alive, he accused Adams of extreme incompetence. On July 23rd of 1956, Gertrude Hullett died, and Adams recorded the cause of death as having been the result of a brain hemorrhage. An official investigation, however, arrived at the conclusion that she had committed suicide. Camps argued that she had been poisoned with sleeping pills, like Miss Morell before her. Hullett left several valuable items to Dr. Adams, including a Rolls Royce. Gossip surrounding Adams began circulating around the close-knit seaside community. Whether there was truth in the allegations that Adams was an angel of death, preying on vulnerable wealthy widows, or was an angel of mercy, kindly alleviating suffering, was up for conjecture. It appears that the death of Hullett in 1956 precipitated a state of affairs that was to bring Adams to the attention of the authorities. Adams was finally investigated once the town's gossip had gotten too great, and he was arrested on suspicion of murder. The typical rumors were that Adams' bedside manner was to persuade the wealthy to write up a will which would leave him with access to all of their financial assets before administering a lethal concoction of drugs. When the accusations had reached such a peak that the police had little to no choice but to engage in this bizarre matter. While the investigation lasted several months, on October 1st of 1956, the police confronted Dr. Adams with their suspicions concerning his ill patient, Miss Morell. His defense was that she was suffering from terrible pain and wanted to die and argued that it wasn't illegal to ease the suffering of the terminally ill. But it wasn't the easing of his patient's pain that concerned the police. It was the legacies left behind in the patient's wills that raised suspicion of Adam's true motives. His trial took place in March of 1957. Jeffrey Lawrence acted as Adam's defense, made sure to make a point that the charges against him were mainly based off of testimonies from the nurses who had worked for Miss Morell. Miss Morrell had 24-hour basis care from a team of four nurses, alleged that Dr. Adams routinely injected his patients with excessive doses of pain-killing drugs such as morphine and heroin. Despite being deeply shocked and suspicious of his behavior, the fellow nurses felt that there was little that they could do to protect their patient from his activities. August 1939. Adams was treating Angie's pipe. Her solicitors, however, were concerned at the amount of hypnotic drugs he was giving her, and asked another doctor, Dr. Matthew, to take over treatment. Dr. Matthew examined her in Adam's presence, but could find no disease present. Moreover, the patient was deeply under the influence of drugs. 
and coherent and gave her age as 200 years. Later, during the examination, Adam stepped forward unexpectedly and gave Mrs. Pike an injection of morphia. Asked why he did this, Adams replied, because she might be violent. Dr. Matthew discovered that Adams had banned all relatives from seeing her. Dr. Matthew withdrew Adams' medication, and after eight weeks of his care, Mrs. Pike was able to do her own shopping and had regained her full faculties. The situation looked bleak for Dr. Adams until QC Lawrence cross-examined the first of the nurses who had given such damning evidence. Lawrence managed to procure from her the fact that all injections given to Miss Morrell had been carefully recorded in a notebook, together with details of her condition at all stages during her illness. This procedure was standard practice for any terminally ill patient. On April 15, 1957, it took the jury 45 minutes to find Adams not guilty. Despite the not guilty verdict, the police still thought Adams was guilty not just of two murders, but the deaths of many patients. The press appeared to share this opinion. A Fleet Street journalist at the time is known to have said that word on the street was that Adams had killed so many and seemed so likely to kill so many more that the police had been obligated to prosecute, even though their case was not quite ready. Adams spent his remaining days in Eastbourne, in spite of his tarnished reputation, with some still believing that he had murdered at least eight people Others, notably patients and friends, remained convinced of his innocence. Please.